My name's Ray Tallis. I'm professor, or was professor, of geriatric medicine at the University of Manchester uh, until recently. And I guess my ambition has always been that people should live a longer life, but not at the cost of having a longer period of illness before they die. And one of the exciting things of working in geriatric medicine is seeing how it's possible, apparently, to square the circle by enabling people to live longer without them necessarily having more illness before they die. At the present situation, the unisex average, as it were, Mr. and Mrs. Smith fall into trouble medically in their late 60s, perhaps early 70s, and death usually occurs in the very late 70s. So there's a period before death in which people are unwell or they have unsatisfactory health. And the challenge really is to see what happens next. And there are several scenarios. One is that people may indeed live much, much longer, but they fall into trouble in life still in their late 60s, early 70s, which means they have a much longer period of illness before they die. And that's not a very attractive scenario. Another scenario is that they live longer, but the onset of chronic disabling illness or whatever is prolonged by the same amount. So the period of illness before death is just the same, but everything is, as it were, shifted to the right on the graph. The most attractive scenario is where people live a modest amount longer, but the onset of serious disabling illness is postponed to a much greater degree. So there is only a very short period of illness before death. This is a model that was put forward 30 odd years ago by an American called Fries. It's the model that he described as that of the compression of illness or compression of morbidity before death model. And that's the one I find most attractive, particularly in relation to myself. <coughs> That model will come about if we do at least two things. One is if we prevent ill health as far as we can, and the other is if we think rationally about pensions and insurance and so on. And these are things that can actually be relevant to younger people. Right from early life, you can do things to ensure you don't fall victim towards the end of your life to things like strokes and other disabling conditions. For example, not smoking, controlling drinking, having an appropriate diet, taking plenty of exercise, and so on and so forth. Everybody knows all these things, but it's actually quite difficult to act on what one knows, but it's very important to do so right from the beginning. And the other is to take provision for what is going to be a longer, healthy old age. And that means that, unfortunately, you're going to have to pay a little bit more into your pensions, and you may indeed have to start, well, be able to take your pension or begin as a pensioner rather later in life. There's some things I'm very enthusiastic about and some things I'm less enthusiastic about. The things I'm enthusiastic about are about the use of information technology, as it were, to wire in older people to the big conversation so they are not excluded. And that includes, obviously, uh, the use of the internet, uh, the use of various forms of electronic communication, and I think older people can particularly benefit from that, particularly if they are, for example, uh, immobilized or housebound or whatever. I also think information technology has potentially a huge role for delivering um, some kinds of health care. For example, the monitoring of illness uh, for um, warning either the patient or the doctor that something's going awry and so on. I'm much less enthusiastic at the use or the idea of using um, electronic technologies, robots and so on, to replace hands-on care. And I think one of the, it's very important to appreciate that hands-on care is absolutely central to the humane support of older people. And we'll need more of that, not less of that, even when the electronic utopia comes, because people do require the human touch.